Hey folks, Attorney Andrew Branca here from Law of Self-Defense. And of course, by now you've all heard about the active shooting event up in Buffalo, New York. And I wanted to share a quick video with you today to discuss not really that shooting per se, but active shooting situations in general from a self-defense law perspective. Now, I'm talking about active shooter scenarios here in the context of defense of others. Obviously, an active shooter could be threatening you directly and personally, but that's really a straight-up self-defense analysis. What gets more complicated is when you become aware of an active shooter and you decide to intervene in that event. You're really protecting other people there. You could just run away, but you're deciding to intervene to protect the other people being targeted by that active shooter. Now, Defense of other situations really, to my mind, run into one of three buckets. And the first bucket is the one that creates the greatest exceptional legal risk compared to a self-defense situation. Now, if you're in a self-defense situation, there's a threat against you directly, you have about as good an understanding of what's going on as you could hope for. It's you being threatened, it's you making the decisions, the evaluations about how to respond, against that force being threatened against you. When you're coming to the defense of another person, however, there comes a new factor, an additional factor of uncertainty, what I call the zone of ambiguity. You may not know exactly what's going on. You may not know who, in fact, is the bad actor. And this exceptional risk is greatest when we're talking about a defense of strangers situation. And by that, I don't mean an active shooter situation. I mean there's one other person unknown to you, a stranger to you, apparently being threatened by an attacker, and you decide to intervene in that confrontation to save the person being threatened. Well, you don't really know probably what happened there. You may have turned a corner, seen the fight in progress. Who really started it? Especially if it's a domestic kind of situation, is the person you're defending going to later turn around and say you were the problem? Because you threatened or used force against the person who turns out to be their romantic interest or their spouse. So they have an interest in testifying against you regardless of the actual merits of your intervening to save them from physical harm. So defense of strangers has that unique risk that isn't present in a self-defense situation, that risk of ambiguity, not knowing for sure what's going on, not knowing for sure that you're defending the innocent person or that the person you're defending is going to testify accurately about the good intentions of your intervention. The second category of defense of others mitigates that risk. And this is when we're coming to the defense, not of a stranger, but of someone known to us, a family member, a work colleague, a close friend. We know something about their character. We know whether it's likely or not they were, in fact, the initial aggressor in a fight, for example. So the ambiguity risks are, are much reduced. They're probably not zero, but they're much, much less than they would be if you had simply turned a corner, seen a stranger in a fight, and decided to come to their rescue. Then we get to the third bucket, which is what we're really talking about here today, which is the active shooter event. Now, in one sense, the active shooter, of course, is almost certainly engaging people you don't know personally. Like this case up in Buffalo, New York, the active shooter went into a grocery store. If you were there, you probably don't know any people in the grocery store. So if you were going to intervene against an active sh shooter, you'd be coming to the defense of strangers. But an active shooter situation is typically different than a traditional defense of a stranger, defense of other scenario, because it lacks the ambiguity of the defense of a stranger situation. So again, defense of a stranger, one particular individual appears to be threatened. You turn the corner, saw the fight, they look vulnerable. You decide to come to their defense. There's a lot of ambiguity there. You don't really know what's happening, what happened, how the situation got to where it is. If it's an active shooter event and someone's walking around the grocery store just potting people with a rifle, there's not much ambiguity there. There is no innocent explanation for that conduct by the active shooter. So that's what makes intervening in an active shooter event unique. The key difference between that and other defense of other situation is that there really is no ambiguity about what's going on. You know that you're engaging a bad actor. And because of that lack of ambiguity, the legal risk in intervening against an actual active shooter is about as close to zero as you could possibly hope for, assuming, of course, you don't do it in a negligent manner. Now, just because the legal risk may be much reduced, 
doesn't mean there's no risk. There is, of course, the physical risk. I mean, you're going into a gunfight. People die in gunfights and not always the bad guy. There's no magic pixie dust that says you win against the active shooter. In fact, in Buffalo, apparently there was an armed security guard, a good guy, who engaged the active shooter and was killed by the active shooter because reports vary, but because the active shooter was wearing body armor, the active shooter had a long gun, the security guard, as normal, had a, had a handgun. <clears throat> he lost that fight, that security guard. It's tragic, it's terrible. Um, but of course, that could happen to any of us. Most of us are not walking around in public with a long gun. We're walking around with a modest, mid-size, typically, self-defense pistol, maybe smaller than that. Um, and the active shooter comes into wherever we are with a long gun and starts shooting people. That's the same kind of fight we're looking at ourselves if we decide to intervene. So there is always, of course, the physical fight, and maybe the physical fight is much aggravated compared to a more traditional uh, home invasion, uh, armed robbery, carjacking kind of scenario where it's more likely that the aggressor would also be armed with a handgun rather than a long gun. So you do have to take that into consideration. But in terms of the one key difference of active shooter scenarios compared to other more traditional defense of other scenarios, the key difference is the lack of ambiguity about what's happening. You can be fairly confident that you're actually engaging the person who's the bad guy in that fight and that you won't be bit in the butt after the fact by some ambiguity about the situation. All right, folks, that's what I wanted to share with all of you today. Until we meet again, remember, if you have a gun, carry a gun so that you're hard to kill. That's why I carry a gun, so I'm hard to kill, so my family is hard to kill. Then you also owe it to yourself and your family to make sure you know the law so you're hard to convict. Until next time, I remain Attorney Andrew Branca for Law of Self-Defense. Stay safe.